All right. While we're switching back, oops. while we're switching back here, um, just want to call up our next uh, presenter, Dr. Bob Knight with Wetland Solutions. Bob, Bob, if you, Dr. Knight, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Knight. I'm the um, I'm senior consultant with Wetland Solutions Incorporated. Uh, I've been working as an environmental scientist in Florida for uh, over 40 years now on water quality issues, uh, wetland issues, springs issues, river issues, estuarine issues. Uh, and I uh, was introduced to the Everglades uh, projects in 1994 when I was asked by the district to review uh, the preliminary plans for the ENR. I uh, then was involved a lot in the STAs in the Everglades and both in C43 and C44 through the SERP projects. Um, and I want to talk about the history, uh, where, we, where we're coming from, hopefully where we're going to, uh, and just reinforce that there's a lot of information, a lot of people that have gone before us today who have helped understand this system and, and really defined it. Uh, for, no, I guess I'm in charge of the slides, too. Can you do that? Oh, no, I can do that. Um, I'll go ahead and put the first my first slide up. But um, I also I want to just uh, basically thank the people by these names in case any of them were in the audience. Uh, J.F. Murdoch, Ben McPherson, uh, Robert Chamberlain, Peter Doring. Did I see Peter here? No. Okay. Um, anyway, and Carla Palmer actually got me uh, going on the the C43 restoration uh, years ago. So uh, these are some of the people that went before. I'm sure there are many more. Um, before we all die out, it's good to, to talk to each other and, uh, and, and pass on a little bit on what we know. Uh, the uh, project area, as you're aware, is really the area between Lake Okeechobee and the uh, Gulf of Mexico here. Uh, and it's uh, got some very different characteristics. Uh, Okeechobee is uh, basically uh, appears to be about 30 to 50 percent of the loads uh, in water are from Okeechobee, closer to 30 percent based on more recent data. Uh, but then uh, over 50% of the loads are actually from within the freshwater portion of the basin, which is the area between Lake Okeechobee and the Franklin Lock at S79. And the remaining 20% of the, of the water loads, uh, water and nutrient loads are from downstream. That's, those are numbers that have stuck in my head. I hope they're fairly accurate still. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very large uh, uh, area of sources uh, that are causing the problem. I think um, I got most specifically involved in 2003 as part of the SERP project uh, with Stanley consultants uh, looking at uh, the water quality issues and, and the uh, land uses in the actual basin itself. Uh, and that around that time, the DEP issued this uh, water quality assessment report. It basically demonstrated that uh, there were a lot of impaired water bodies here. Uh, this is the really the, the state's uh, very active movement in identifying impaired water bodies. Uh, it turned out that there was impairment from almost everything on the list of uh, water quality criteria in Florida, including fecal coliforms, total coliforms, and nutrients. Nitrogen and phosphorus were both implicated uh, because of chlorophyll increases, basically algae increases, dissolved oxygen, iron, copper conductance, specific conductance, and other uh, issues. Uh, that uh, obviously led to a number of actions by DEP. Can you hear me all right where I'm standing? Okay. Um, I was asked by uh, Carla Palmer in 2005, uh, myself and Gary Goforth uh, uh, worked with, a, uh, with the district to come up with a sort of a, a summation of all these issues, uh, similar to what we're doing again of, of where do we stand in 2005. And there was, that's why I became familiar with these issues. Uh, basically, the white paper was intended to provide options for decision makers to resolve these problems in 2005, you know, everybody was saying, why not now? Uh, the CRE is the Caloosahatchee River and Estuary, we just abbreviated. Uh, it was challenged by altered, altered salinity, nutrient loads, and flow shifts between the wet and the dry season. And the channelization, ca canalization of the Caloosahatchee River, of course, it's a man made system uh, for a large part. There's very little of the natural Caloosahatchee left, if, it, if any. Headwaters is Okeechobee, but there was a canal that connected it to the lake. Uh, that canal was improved. Those three locks and dams were put in. 
uh, in the 30s and in the 60s. Uh, and, and then the areas developed and there's over a million people living in the area now that are impacting it in addition to the agricultural impacts, which continue to be the largest component. Uh, the regulatory issues uh, related to the freshwater volumes coming from Lake O um, are a, uh, it's unusual in that they are a large flow, low concentration issue. And uh, it's much more difficult to treat uh, nutrients in water when they're a low concentration uh, than when they're at a high concentration. You get much greater mass removal at high concentration, low concentration, and takes a, a bigger treatment area typically. And that's one reason the stormwater treatment areas are so big. Um, over 50,000 acres of treatment marshes to deal with phosphorus levels uh, that are very low, relatively low to start with, 100 parts per billion, 150 parts per billion, to try to get those down to 20 parts per billion. Uh, the, these changes in, in water flow and in nutrients over time led to just horrific impacts, as we've seen some evidence of just in the last few years. But this, these impacts go all the way back to the 1980s. Uh, in the papers in the late 1970s and 80s by LaRose, um, they described the impacts. They were already having algal blooms. Uh, so um, a, a lot has, uh, has been pointed out in the past. The CERT plan uh, came into being in 2000 and included uh, this system. Uh, and like I said, this is, a, this is a, a strange system in that we have to deal with the water volume as well as the flow. There's more than one way to do that. Uh, this, this report basically identified a lot of things, and especially the need for best management practices. What we're finding more and more around the state is best management practices are not enough for agricultural areas. We need to go to advanced best management practices. We basically need to put um, numerical limits on nutrients coming off of agricultural systems and develop specific best management practices that attain those limits. Uh, if we don't do that, we won't get to a solution, in my opinion. Um, so stormwater, municipal wastewater, advanced treatment, this, uh, this is easier. There's usually a governmental agency that's responsible. There's a lot of this has already happened in this watershed, and uh, that's good. But then constructed wetlands or uh, various natural treatment systems turn out to, in many cases, be the best option, uh, as we saw with the STAs. We went through years and years of evaluation of different technologies for the phosphorus removal in the Everglades, and the, the technology that was ultimately chosen was a natural technology that does not run off of fossil fuel energies as much as uh, most conventional technologies do. And, and it will be interesting to see if we end up with that result again from the current feasibility study. Uh, in 2005, the test cells were constructed. Two test cells uh, were constructed on the reservoir footprint. Uh, we got to, uh, WSI got to do a water quality study on those test cells uh, with, with uh, uh, with Stanley and uh, the the test cell, well, the, the reservoir is shown there. It's near the Franklin Lock south of, of the Caloosahatchee. Uh, they are about four and a half acres. They were about four and a half acres. They've been dismantled now. I understand they're completely gone. Um, and they were about up to 19 foot of water depth. There were two of them tested, one uh, with a liner and one without a liner, basically. And the liner option has been chosen. We may hear more about that later. Uh, but the water quality study was my focus because we're very aware that when you build a large mass of water like this, you will get some just intrinsic uh, water quality treatment as well as water quality worsening in some respects. Um, so these data, which are uh, summarized in that report, a district report, uh, showed that we got fairly significant nitrogen removal in the test cells. These test cells were not operated, were not operated exactly to simulate the full-scale system and so they held water for a fairly long period of time and they got they, they removed most of the biologically available uh, nitrogen just in the test cells uh, in the process and also a very large amount of phosphorus was off at the bottom but the nitrogen removal was average 14 percent the phosphorus removal averaged 74 percent in these test cells uh, but there was actually an increase in total suspended solids in at, during part of the time which is algae basically growing in the test cells. And this certainly will be an issue in a full-scale reservoir is that we have to then deal with, uh, that's, a, that's a conversion of nutrients from uh, in the, dissolved in the water to uh, taken up by algae. That's what algae do is they, they trap nutrients and, and make their own biomass. That will probably very likely need to be dealt with downstream from the reservoir. 
uh, other than just chemical treatment in the reservoir, which is uh, frustrating, expensive, and, uh, and environmentally harmful to some extent. Uh, this, this was followed by the, the recognition that wetlands were probably the treatment system that would go after the reservoir. And uh, CH Tillam Hill got a project with the district looking at, once again, all the technologies that were available at the time. They focused in on, on some sort of advanced hybrid wetland systems. This is one of their reports. Um, they uh, were focused, of course, on dissol the dissolved organic nitrogen, which is the most recalcitrant, difficult part of the nitrogen load to remove. Uh, any technology is going to have a lot of trouble with organic nitrogen. Uh, and they, they came up with some suggestions. They also made a, a pretty wild prediction that they could get 30 to 50 percent of that nitrogen removed. And, and that has not uh, been borne out since then. At the same time, uh, DEP uh, developed their total maximum daily loads for uh, the Caloosahatchee. Uh, basically, they estimated at that time of their study, 5,900 tons per year of nitrogen uh, was in, coming into the Caloosahatchee. Uh, like I said, about 30% uh, from Lake Okeechobee, about 50% uh, from the, the basin. And uh, about the TMDL, in other words, what's the maximum load that the system can support was about 4,500 tons per year, which the difference between 5,900 and 4,500 is about a 23% load reduction is what they uh, concluded in the TMDL. And that is still the, and this TMDL is for the estuarine portion of the system. There is not one yet for the freshwater portion of the system. Uh, so, but a TMDL leads to a BMAP, a Basin Management Action Plan, and that's uh, still needed. Um, uh, but maybe making progress. I mean, I'd like to hear more about that today. Uh, the district organized a peer review panel. Uh, the CH Tillam Hill recommendations were uh, pretty open-ended, and they decided to put a peer review panel together that I was fortunate to be on, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Alex Horn from the University of California in Berkeley, who works on, on some advanced uh, wetland treatment options, and Dr. John White from Louisiana State University, who is an expert in, in wet, wetland um, biogeochemistry. The panel met for a year. It was given four tasks uh, to thoroughly review and evaluate the CH Tillam Hill deliverables. Uh, to provide guidance, uh, CH Tillam Hill uh, essentially uh, designed a treatment facility to uh, and move forward with uh, these wetland options and to uh, recommend any changes to that that needed to be made and recommend parallel work efforts um, either experimental or other data review efforts, similar to this feasibility study that's uh, starting now to get additional information just to further perfect things as things move forward uh, and to have a workshop related to those things. The focus is on technologies that can re reduce organic nitrogen to very low levels. And this is a, a scatter plot of, of various wetland systems. Uh, the, the, the reservoir and wetland work at C43, C44, uh, the STA at C44, Lakeland Wetland, the Orlando Wetland, and uh, it appears that wetlands can get down to a fairly low organic nitrogen. And I know there's a talk that Chris Keller is giving later today to talk about that. Um, but the panel basically rejected the plan that uh, CH Tuam Hill uh, proposed to actually try to convert, uh, to spend a lot of effort on converting uh, biologically available organic nitrogen to recalcitrant organic nitrogen. That it just didn't appear to be a feasible option based on the, the data that they presented. And so the panel recommended moving forward with a, thank you, uh, with a, uh, a different option, which was uh, uh, prepared by WSI once again uh, to uh, design a facility uh, for this purpose. And uh, that was a, a, a couple year project basically that came up with the plan to build mesocosms to get process related data for a full-scale water quality treatment system, test cells similar to the STA, uh, the preliminary design, and then field-scale cells. Because building a full-scale system at uh, a level like this for nitrogen removal, this is different from the STA, this is for nitrogen removal, has never been done before at this scale. And uh, so it is necessary to have actually various scales of testing to develop good design criteria so you're not wasting your money. And that's what was done. The first part of that uh, is just being wrapped up, the mesocosm test that we're going to hear more about today from Cassandra Armstrong and uh, JTEC. And uh, you already saw a picture of these. Just in my conclusion, the summary is that 
this process, this project's been going on a long time. It's frustrating for all of us that have aged in this in this process, and I hope we'll do everything we can to expedite actual uh, moving into construction of uh, this wonderful reservoir is finally uh, entering construction. But uh, we, there may be things we can do in parallel with that that uh, accelerate the construction of, of the treatment process as well. Um, and a lot of resources have been spent on it. Um, it seems to me that a viable plan must include uh, work still in Lake Okeechobee. And I believe that's everybody's intention is we're going to continue to work on Lake Okeechobee. We've got to reduce those nutrient loads and the wet weather discharges. Uh, additional work needs to be done on the sources in this CRE itself in the basin. Uh, and I know there was work that the district was doing on that. I don't know that it, maybe that needs to be picked up again to actually put uh, point source control on those agricultural properties in the basin. And then the work that continues in the estuary portion, which I think is the loads. So uh, let's get to work. Thank you. Please join me in giving him a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Knight. We're going to ask for you to stay close by uh, because we're going to have a little bit of Q&A now. So again, for those of you who have just joined us online, you are welcome to participate as well. Uh, we're going to be doing this via minty.com. The presentation code is 143919. If you would just take a moment to log in now if you haven't already. After we're done all these questions. <laughs> It'll be coming up on the screen. If you want, just have the paper and pen. All right. And also, just a quick note for those of you online, if you wouldn't mind muting uh, at the break, we're going to figure this out. But in the meantime, we can hear you. So please mute your line. All right. So now the uh, questions should be open for you to enter your own questions regarding the C43 water quality treatment presentation that we just heard from Dr. Bob Knight. So we'll wait a moment and let these come in. I can start answering. Uh, so total killed all nitrogen TKN is a, a measure of organic nitrogen and ammonia. Uh, so it's different in that it includes ammonia in addition to organic nitrogen. Um, and uh, what are advanced BMPs? We don't know yet. They're advanced. Uh, we know in some areas of the state, like I'm in the Springs area where I do a lot of work, uh, advanced BMPs are actually converting intensive agriculture to less intensive land use practices such as forestry or forest type agriculture. And down in this basin, uh, it may be similar things uh, where we go from orange groves to pasture or, or something with a lower footprint, basically a lower nutrient footprint. Um, I can't answer any policy issues. I'm not the person to ask. Um, uh, so how is it actually phosphorus sequestered in the test cells from data from other systems? We didn't actually study it there, but data from other systems, the phosphorus is sequestered basically in the sediments. Uh, it's, there's a, a rain of organic matter constantly in these systems as algal cells die. They, they settle in the sediments and they're basically stored, the phosphorus is stored in the sediments. The nitrogen that's removed, it's usually coming in in the nitrate or ammonia forms that's converted to an, a gas, an atmospheric gas. And so the nitrogen is actually lost permanently from the system, which is a real fortunate aspect of nitrogen control. Uh, both nitrogen and phosphorus are important in Clusahatchee and in the estuary to some extent. These, these are two of the macronutrients in addition to carbon. Those three nutrients are needed in the largest amounts. And they, we have to be concerned about all of them uh, because if if um, if they're all present in some level, then there's nothing limiting growth other than light. And one of the things that limits algal growth in the river is the tannic water that comes in from the watershed as well, or from Lake Okeechobee. Uh, so that turns out that's actually important, but that then has a negative effect on the estuary where it shades out the submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, I, the idea, these aren't 
stormwater treatment areas is just a word. It's just a, it's a term for a certain technology. It's basically constructed natural treatment systems is what they are. And they have the properties of natural wetlands, but they're not natural. They're constructed. So uh, we could call them stormwater treatment areas. We could call them something totally different in this basin. It wouldn't matter. Uh, basically, the, the work that's been done shows that these natural plant communities are both floating, uh, submerged and emergent wetland plants are very effective at removing nutrients either through the burial of phosphorus or through the process of denitrification, which is a microbial process that uses nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen as a source of oxygen to survive in anaerobic conditions. And in those anaerobic conditions, they need organic matter for food. And so the plants provide the food for the microbes that do the work. It's, it's just a natural treatment process. Um, one more. Well, one question is why not a wetland instead of a reservoir? Um, the a shallow wetland will not have a water storage capacity, and water storage was identified in surface, the key issue. And it is the first part of this. If you can store the water, then you can change the period, the, the periodicity of the flows. And, the, and the, that periodicity is, was identified as the biggest problem, even bigger than the nutrient issues. So uh, the fact that the two can work together is very important. Um, but ultimately, a reservoir, some, some of our reservoirs in the state are much shallower than, than this. And it'll be a trade-off. It'll be a learning process over time in terms of what it takes to get the best result. Thank you.